happiness. Everyone is looking for it, but we look for it in all the wrong places. What if we had a guide that showed us what John Wesley called the complete art of happiness? We do. Join us this fall as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, one sermon that changed the world. At this time before the lesson, we'd like to ask all the Christian soldiers and any any young person in sixth grade and below to come forward and help us sing this next song. So if parents, you might want to bring your children down or <clears throat> come forward and stand on the steps. You know, Jesus told us, unless you become his little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. We have to have the hearts of little children. The wise man's song is thought of as a children's song. But, you know, if you stop and think about it, it's such a powerful message. It's the same message that Jesus put in the greatest sermon ever preached. So come on and come in front here. And we're going to ask the adults to stand. And adults, I hope you have the hearts of little children. And let's sing. Adults sing to the children here and the children out here sing to the adults as we sing this song. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And the rains came tumbling down. Oh, the rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up, and the house on the rock stood firm. Oh, the foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand, and the rains came tumbling down. Oh, the rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up, and the foolish man's house went smack. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. Build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. Build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ, and the blessings will come down. Oh, the blessings come down as the prayers go up. The blessings come down as the prayers go up. The blessings come down as the prayers go up. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a sleep. Well, if that wasn't the cutest thing ever, I don't know what is. We've come to the end of a series on the Sermon on the Mount. And this is where Jesus wraps it all up with a nice little bow. This is the end of the sermon. It begins in verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Some versions say, act on them. Some say, do them. I've always liked the ESV on this. Put it into practice. Kim Linehan was an American Olympic swimmer who for eight years held the world record in the women's 1,500-meter freestyle. Competing at 18 years of age, Kim would do endless exercises. She would swim eight to ten miles a day. And when she was asked, what's the hardest part of your regimen? She said, that's easy, getting in the water. I don't doubt it. 
That's what perfection requires. Michael Jordan wanted to be the best basketball player who ever lived. In 1988, he was the MVP in just the third year in the league, averaging 37 points a game. But that wasn't enough for him. In 1989, he sensed he needed to be better. And so he hired a personal trainer. And his personal trainer put him under a strict workout regimen to accompany his already strict diet. And this is the way his trainer described MJ. See, he's the most competitive person I've ever met. He always felt like somebody else was going to outwork him, and so he was going to outwork them. He knew his strengths and his weaknesses. He turned his weaknesses into strengths. Every year there was an evolution to his game, a new shot, a new move. He was never satisfied. No matter how many championships or titles, what they said about him, his accolades, he always wanted to be better. Most practices have the five starters on the same team against a practice squad. Not them. Michael would always put Scottie Pippen on the other team. He wanted to play against the best. He worked until he had no weaknesses in his game, and he did whatever the team needed to win. His game was easy, says his personal trainer, because he practiced extremely hard. From so much practicing, from all the different aspects, studying film, being well-prepared, he had the edge on the competition. There's more to preparing for a basketball game, said his trainer, than simply dribbling. Knowing the opposing team's capability, it's a job. The more you're prepared for it, the better you'll be at it. But preparation takes hard work and sacrifice. James Clear wrote a book called Atomic Habits, and in that book he said, every action you take is a vote for the kind of person that you want to be. So we talk about habits. There was a, there's an old wives' tale that's been passing around for a while that says it takes 21 days to develop a habit. Well, the latest science says that's not true. It takes much more. In fact, on average, it takes 66 days to develop a habit. And when those who were studying this looked at all the research, for some people, for many people, it took up to eight months. Habits are not easy. And it takes a while to form them. And you need to keep at it so that they won't break. Habits are hard. But if every action you choose is a vote for the person you want to be, and practice makes perfect, we need to think about our intentionality. For example, did you know that during COVID, I would have thought with nothing to do, people would have done more Bible reading? But all the evidence goes to the contrary. The number of people who reported that they read their Bibles dropped dramatically during COVID. In fact, even though 77% of U.S. adults have a Bible in their home, when asked, how many of you take any time reading your Bible on your own outside of a church setting, say, three times a year? 39% said yes. Now, I want you to think about this with how long it takes to build a habit. This is a chart of how we spend our year. We don't actually sleep 8, 9, 10 hours, especially if you have children. They say on average it's 6 to 7. And so you have a lot of time on your hands. Well, the average U.S. adult spends 3 hours 15 minutes on their phone and another two hours on their television every day. So in a year, this is what it would look like. Still looks like plenty of time. What will you do with that time? Well, you could go to church. You see this little sliver? This is if you attended church for Bible class, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and an agape meeting during the middle of the week. This is how much of your year would be in church. Remember, only 39% of people surveyed said they engage in spiritual habits on their own at least three times a year outside of a worship setting. And as you know, most people aren't in church that often. In fact, if you went to church just one time every week for the year, 
This would be the amount of time in which you're engaging in spiritual practices of any kind. It takes 66 days to develop a habit. For some, it takes up to eight months. Being intentional is required in trying to decide what differences you're going to make in your life. And every action you take or don't take is a vote for the kind of person you want to be. Here's my question. What does it mean for us to practice perfection? We could say that when Jesus says, those who hears these sayings of mine and puts them into practice, we could say what he's getting at is we need to be more intentional about doing the right things the right way. I have no doubt there are plenty of Bible verses that will challenge us to do the right things in the right way. But I believe the Sermon on the Mount is more than that. We could say, okay, it's more than just trying to keep all the right rules. Maybe he's also just trying to give us an understanding, an outline of moral ideals. There's plenty of those. But can I remind you, if you think of the Sermon on the Mount as a list of rules or even a list of moral ideals, it becomes a list, a list you can keep in your pocket that you can achieve. And once achieving, then you say to yourself, I have done righteousness. But that misses the point as well. I believe the Sermon on the Mount is a challenge beyond rules and beyond moral ideals. It's a challenge to let God be God in every aspect of our life, every moment of our life. It is learning to practice the presence, not of my righteousness, but the presence of God. If you want to know what that looks like, you've got to remember that for the Bible writers... Righteousness is not found in my actions, but it's found in Christ's action. And it turns out that the rock, the shelter, the anchor point of our life is not when we finally figured out how to do everything right, but it's when we figure out who is right. And his name is Jesus Christ. Throughout the Bible, if you're looking for what it means to call someone or something your rock, you'll find the language pointing to God. Take a look at Deuteronomy 32. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. Just a few verses later in the same chapter. Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, stout, and sleek, but then he forsook God who made him and scoffed at the rock of his salvation. For you were unmindful of the rock that bore you. You forgot the God who gave you birth. It's why in the New Testament, when Paul is reflecting on the wilderness wanderings of the Israelites, referring back to the language of Deuteronomy, Paul says, there was a rock. There was a rock among you. And I know that we think about the rock that Moses tried to split, and we think about rocks in our lives, and we think about when we've done good things. But Paul makes it very clear that when everyone was under the cloud and they all passed through the sea, they all ate the same spiritual food, they drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock, who throughout the Old Testament is called Yahweh, is Christ Anchored to the rock that cannot move is the end of the sermon that points us away from ourselves and points us to God. In 1692, a book was published one year after the death of a man known forever as Brother Lawrence. He was a monk. And what we know about this book is that it was a collection of his thoughts, ideas, and letters He lived a very simple life. And what I love about this book is he talks about how to see God in the smallest events of the day, while folding laundry, while washing the pots and pans, while planting and growing the garden, while taking lint off of his clothes. He found opportunities to see something about who God is in the smallest details of his life. And so he called the book, The Practice of the Presence of God. What would it look like 
Instead of trying to make a list and say, okay, if I'm ever in the situation where I've got to deal with a cheating spouse or I've got to deal with a person who's gilding the lily and telling me to buy a car that isn't really one I should buy or I'm right in the situation where somebody's actually using the word raka, then I'll know what to do. What if instead of seeing it as a list of rules for specific occasions... We saw Jesus saying, here's the kind of life I'm calling you to live. Here are some situations in which the person who has been formed by God and is anchored to the rock can only think and act out of a sense of how would Christ respond in this situation. I'm convinced, like the karate kid, you're only ready to do that in the big situations of life. If you've prepared yourself to see God at work, in the small situations of life. An inside-out religion, which is what the Sermon on the Mount is teaching us, means we're not trying harder to fight our own desires. Every second saying, well, I really want to beat the pulp out of this guy, but instead I'm going to turn the other teach te- because God said so. Instead, learning to want something different than what all of our impulses have been telling us. It's not for God to help us fight against our desires, but for God to change our desires. I love the way Philip's translation puts Galatians 5. You know the passage about the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We know there's no law against these, but look at the way Philip's translates the next line. Those who belong to Christ have crucified their old nature with everything that it loved and lusted for. It's not just that we do new things in a new way. It's that we want what God wants. We're being called to have a change of heart. When you have spiritual practices listed in Matthew 6... He lists when you pray, when you give, when you fast. And I've always been amazed that he doesn't say you ought to pray. He doesn't say if you pray. He assumes you do. And as several commentaries I was reading all pointed out, it looks as if this is a typical Jewish way. You find this in the Old Testament. That when you name three things with a when, you're signifying far more than just those three things. He seems to be pointing to all the spiritual disciplines in your life. When you pray, when you give, when you fast, you know, when you act in ways that say, I want more of God and less of myself. Make sure you do it in a way that really brings all the attention to God and not to yourself. And so praying, giving, fasting, these are opportunities to give to God, give to others, Take the focus off of you. It turns out spiritual disciplines is an opportunity to want less in this world because you have more of God. And so it's a little ironic. Less is more. Going down the ladder is going up. How do you fight against materialism? Want less. How do you fight gluttony? Want less. How do you fight marriage troubles? Expect less out of others and more of yourself. How do you deal with a troubling neighbor? Expect less of them and more from you. If you want less from others because God supplies your need, if you expect less from others since God gives validation, you can desire to live out the perfect goodness of God by wanting to want what God wants. Most practice will not be doing more. It'll be wanting less. There are all sorts of spiritual disciplines. There are books on it. You have the spiritual discipline of simplicity or solidarity or solitude. You have peacemaking and celebration and quietness. And all of these are really opportunities not to acquire more things, but to find joy and patience, kindness, and goodness in what little you have or in what you're able to dispense with so that others can have. We find more in the less. We find joy in the giving. It is true, is it not, that what we're trying to find is a way to create an environment 
that can withstand any storm. I remember hearing one time my dad preach a sermon about Paul, and he summarized Paul this way. If you leave me alone, I'm going to preach about Jesus. If you put me in jail, I'm going to write about Jesus. And if you kill me, I'm going to be with Jesus. So you can't get me down. It turns out that in trying to figure out where is happiness in this world? How do I find joy in the midst of sorrow? How do I make sense of life so that life is something I want, I'm for and proud of rather than just a series of difficulties and, and troubles in this life? The answer is less and less and less of self requires, gives room for more and more and more of God. He never promises that he'll take us out of the storm. What he's telling us is to develop an environment full of goodness, love, joy, peace, and patience that can withstand any storm. Think about your storm shelter. What's inside it? Nothing. Some of you are saying nothing because you haven't prepared your storm shelter, but you know what I mean. What's down there? Oh, all the fun and games you ever want. In fact, you probably go down there all the time just because it's so much more fun than everything else in life. No, many of you haven't been down in your storm shelter in a long time. There's nothing down there. Do you know what the storm shelter provides? There is intentional planning to provide in case of a storm. There is enough food and supplies inside to give life when you're within it and enough steel to provide protection from those on the outside. Shelters. Shelters don't change the weather. They don't stop the weather. They shield you from the weather. And what you're going into the shelter for is not for more of what's inside. It's for protection from what's outside. Christ ends his sermon by telling us to anchor to the rock. I remember a few years ago, Dallas Willard said, wouldn't it be neat if every church had a syllabus, a curriculum, a curriculum for Christ-likeness? He said, imagine if you opened up your bulletin and you read, we're going to have a weekend seminar or we're beginning a six-week series on what to do when someone spits at you. Remember, that's what the Sermon on the Mount is. It's a curriculum for Christ-likeness in the most difficult of circumstances. I could imagine what a curriculum for Christ-likeness, preparing people to get spit at, might look like. Because a few years ago, Lee Daniels, the butler, came out. And in the middle of this movie, there is a scene that's very difficult to watch. But it's a scene in which those who are preparing to sit at counters where they're being told you can't sit there simply because of the color of their skin. They're preparing themselves to do a nonviolent protest against this kind of bigotry. But they know what's coming if they do. And so they prepare. They have to stand by each other and prepare each other for the worst. Let me share with you some of the transcript. You know that y'all can't sit here. We'd like to be served, please. This is unprecedented, declares the voice, harking back to the earlier preparation. What we're talking about, but it needs a patience that none of us has ever seen. We're organized. We have a leader with every group. We have lookouts and local phone numbers with ambulances ready. And when one wave comes off the lunch counter, what follows? A whole nother wave of students sitting at that lunch counter, blowing their minds. When one student expresses discomfort, hurling insults at another leader, the person in charge responds, you came here to get yourself prepared and to get her prepared. The scene shifts back to the lunch counter. A mob forms outside. Coming into the restaurant, the hate-filled racists treat the men and women at the lunch counter mercilessly. They smack their heads. They pull their clothes. They scream in their faces. They pour food all over them. And they even spit in their face. But the men and women sitting at the lunch counter take it. They endure it all without fighting back because they were prepared. 
because intentionality caused them to develop habits to withstand the storm because the cause was just. Is it possible that the call of the Sermon on the Mount is not a call to a life of ease, nor is it a call to a a step-by-step plan to escape the problems of the world? What if it's a call to anchor to the rock so that we can be the kind of people who, by the way we react to every situation of life, bring glory to God? When you read the Sermon on the Mount, you're reading an outline for Christ-likeness, and we are letting God know that we'll take it. Because we're anchored to the rock, we can withstand any storm. You know, we, we promise that to God. When we say our prayers, and we say, Lord, not my will but yours be done, when we say, I don't, know what, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. When we say, Lord, I don't know what tomorrow is going to be like, but I'm asking for this, I'm asking for that, but I know that you'll provide what needs to come. We're saying to God, Lord, whatever comes my way, let it be. For that's what we're saying when we say the word, amen. We're begging God to give us what he believes is best, and we're trusting to let it be. I see the Sermon on the Mount calling us to no longer be reactionary, not to plan ahead on how we might fight back when something doesn't go our way, how we might lash out when things are not according to our liking. We learn not to be reactive to the world, but to be proactive, and in this case, to be pro-receptive. Nothing comes your way that hasn't already first come through God. And what does come our way is an opportunity to practice the presence of God. How do you do that? How do we prepare ourselves for that? I want to make a couple of suggestions as we close. I asked some of the members, what helps you prepare? What helps you get ready for the danger zone? One member of our congregation said that the U version's guided prayer is very helpful to her. You might be able to find this online or through an app in which there's daily prompts to remind you of things to be praying for to get your heart and mind ready for what may come today. Others have found the Bible Project, which is a, an excellent website. They have their own reading plan. Not just reading through the Bible, although that's extremely important, but portions of Scripture to fit with certain needs or desires of your heart. Here's what God has to say about that topic that's weighing you down. My best friend a few years ago told me that he had a little book by John Bailey. And in that little book, there were all these guided prayers that he was using and he carried it around in his pocket. Turns out he wasn't the only one doing it. There's a website called I Pray Daily. And there's prayers for the morning, the afternoon, and the evening that might help you find words when you don't have words so that every moment of every every day is a preparation opportunity to be more like Christ when the storms come. And my personal favorite, there's a series of books called Every Moment Holy that's now an app. And they're collections of prayers. And I want to tell you what I love about them. They're not just prayers on Tuesday at 5. There's a prayer for when you see something beautiful. There's a prayer for when you hear a bird sing. There's a prayer for when you're doing laundry. There's a prayer for when you have road rage. That's the one that Katie tells me to read most often. There's prayers when you're facing difficult moments. There's prayers when you're remembering a loss. There's prayers when your children seem out of control. And there's prayers when a new one arrives. I find this very helpful. The idea is that every moment of every day, if you're looking for it, can be an opportunity to put that lasso around the rock, to have less of self, less of anxiety, less of your emotions for what's happening to you now, and more focus on the anchor that will hold through the storms of life. Practice makes perfect. What is your practice. Show me your schedule, and I will tell you what you are hoping to become. 
May we give God our schedule. May we be the kind of people who are not just trying to work harder or work smarter, but rather be receptive to Christ who is using us in every moment to be the kind of people who respond, not my will, but yours be done. Thank you for joining us. I hope you've been encouraged. I hope you've been enriched. And if you have any questions, any thoughts, any comments, reach out to us at prayers at wschurch.net. God bless you. Tune in next week.